Before we start this chapter, we shall have a look into few keywords so that you pay more attention to them when they come across. At the end of this chapter, you shall be in a position to remember these keywords. These are the keywords. Please read them on your own, and whenever they appear during the lecture, please pay more attention. In this lecture, we are going to understand what is testing. We have two learning objectives under this topic. First objective is identify typical objectives of testing, and it is marked as K1. That means questions will be direct and you need to remember each point in it. Second objective is differentiate testing from debugging. It is marked as K2. That means you need to understand this topic. But before we start with these objectives, we shall understand what is testing. In this syllabus, we need to understand testing in the context of software. That means we will discuss only software testing, not hardware testing or electrical testing. So, what is software testing? Software testing is a way to assess the quality of the software and to reduce the risk of software failure in operation. Let's understand this. Once the developer develops software, the software is not directly given to the user. Before giving it to the user, the software undergoes a process to find out the defects and risks associated with software. And this process is called testing. So, by finding defects, we increase the quality of the software and reduce the risk associated with the software. Now, let's see some applications of software. First example is business application, and second one is customer products. Examples of business application are when you go to an airport to book your ticket or when you go to a supermarket to buy items, or when you are working in the office. Software is all around us. And some examples of customer products are washing machines, mobile phones, or coffee makers. They all contain software within them. What is your expectation from this software? The software will work whenever we use it. To ensure this, Testing of software is required. What happens if the software does not work correctly? Such software is called faulty software. And a faulty software can result in loss of money, time, reputation, or in extreme cases can result in injury or death. Now let's see some real-time examples to understand this. This news was in the market that one particular car company recalled 2,000 of its cars due to an issue with the front passenger airbag. Once such news hits the market, the share value of the company goes down and results in huge loss of money. Once these cars are in the garage, they undergo repair and at the same time the company has to do damage control. All this takes lots of effort and time. Let's see an example of loss of reputation. In 2014, there was a breach in the security aspect of eBay software. That means the software was not working as according to the expectations, and if such news comes out, it results in loss of reputation. Sometimes the defect can also result in injury or death. For example, if the airbag system doesn't work as expected. These were the four impacts of faulty software. 
loss of money, time, reputation, and injury or death. Now we will see some of the misconceptions about testing. First misconception is that testing only consists of running test cases, which is completely wrong, as testing is a process and consists of many activities that are listed here. It consists of test planning, test monitoring and control, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test completion. We will discuss each of these activities in detail in our future lectures, but for the time being, you need to remember these activities in the same order as listed here. Second misconception is that testing only involves the execution of the component or system being tested. This is also false, as testing consists of both dynamic and static testing. In dynamic testing, a code is executed, whereas in static testing, a code is not executed. We will provide a detailed lecture on this topic. For the time being, just remember that testing consists of dynamic and static testing techniques. The last misconception which we are going to discuss in this lecture is that testing focuses entirely on verification of requirements. This is also false, as testing focuses on both verification and validation of the requirements. Verification means, are we building product right? Whereas validation means to check if we built the right product. Again, I will provide detailed lecture to explain difference between both. As of now, remember testing focuses on verification and validation of the requirements. Before we end this lecture, let's have a look at the important points. Testing is done to assess the quality of the software and to reduce the risk of software failure in operation. Next point is that faulty software can result in loss of money, time, reputation, and injury or death. Testing is a process which consists of different activities such as test planning, test monitoring, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test completion. Testing consists of static and dynamic testing and consists of verification and validation processes. All these important points are available as a resource and attached with this video. Now we are going to discuss dynamic testing versus static testing. The first point of difference is, static testing is done without execution of code, whereas in dynamic testing, we are executing the code. Let's try to illustrate this with an example. Let us say that we have a customer requirement that states, window shall move up when the up button is pressed and shall move down when the down button is pressed. To fulfill this requirement, you have to write a code for it. Now, suppose a developer has written this particular code. This is a function where he's trying to implement the customer's requirement. When button is pressed, if button up, then move up, otherwise move down. Our task as a tester is to check whether this piece of code is satisfying the requirement or not, and this type of testing is known as static testing. So let's try to test this particular code. Here, it's saying that if up button is pressed, then move up, but if up button is not pressed, then move down. If you execute this code, then the window will never stop moving. It will move up if you press the up button, but the moment you release the button, it will keep on moving down. This means that this code is failing to fulfill the requirement. 
So this is how we find defects through static testing. So why do we call this static? Because when I was performing this test, this code was not moving. It was in one place. This is why this type of testing is called static testing. So that's it for static testing. Now moving on to the dynamic part. Dynamic testing requires you to study the behavior. Here, if you press the down button, then the window moves down. You aren't bothered about the code or how it is written. When you press the up button, window will move up. And when you press the down button, it will slide down. Here, what you need to remember is static testing is carried out without the execution of code, while dynamic testing requires execution of code. Now, let's move to point two in their difference. Static testing is conducted in the verification stage, whereas dynamic testing is performed in the validation stage. Let's find out what they mean by verification stage and validation stage. So here we have the life cycle of a software development activity. First, you will have a user requirement. Next, a system requirement. Then, a global requirement. Then, you will have a detailed design. Once you have this design, then you can start writing the code. Now, static testing is done in the early stage, when we only have the document. As you can see, we don't have the code here. And if we don't have a code, we can't run a software. When we have only documents, then we can only perform a static testing. We can carry out a verification. We can't run the code. So these are the two stages. The first part is for static testing. But once the code is ready, you can perform the dynamic testing. Because now you can run the code. This is why static testing is done in the verification stage, whereas dynamic testing is done in the validation stage. So once you have the code available, you can perform the dynamic testing. Otherwise, it's not possible. Now, we move to the third difference. Static testing is cost-effective, whereas dynamic testing is less cost-effective. Let's try to understand this. As we saw in this diagram, let's assume you were in the requirements stage and you found defect here. Since you found the defect in the same stage, cost to fix the defect is less. But during dynamic testing, you are all the way over here. And if you find fault here, and after analysis you found the requirement is wrong, then you have to change all these documents. This will require more people to solve problems, and cost to fix defect will increase. So this is the reason we said that static testing is cost-effective, while dynamic testing is less cost-effective. Before we end this video, let's have a look into the important points. The first point is, static testing is conducted without execution of code. Dynamic testing requires execution of code. The second point is, static testing is performed in the verification stage, whereas dynamic testing is performed in the validation stage. The third point is, Static testing is cost-effective, while dynamic testing is less cost-effective. There is a fourth point about examples that I want to add here. Static testing examples are walkthroughs and code reviews, whereas with dynamic testing you have to perform functional or non-functional tests. This was the summary of what we covered in this video. See you next time! In this lecture, we are going to see the objective of testing. Let's have a look into the first objective of this syllabus. Just remember, 
You need to know these objectives as it is as question will come directly from this topic since it is marked as K1. Before we jump to the objectives, you must know these important terms which we are going to use in this lecture. We should know what is the meaning of work product and test item. Work product means output. Let's understand this. These are the steps followed during development of software in an organization. First step is to get user requirement. Then we develop system requirement. Then comes the global design. Next is detailed design. And the last step is implementation where software is developed. When we say work product, in the system requirement stage, the output is system requirement. In the global design and detailed design stage, output is design document. And in the implementation stage, output is code. So keep in mind, work product means output. Test item, which is also known as test object, is any document or component or system which is under test. Let's see the same example to understand this. In the requirement stage, requirement is work product. If this has to be reviewed, then requirement is referred to as test item. Similarly, if we are in implementation stage output of this stage is code. And if we want to perform testing on it, then code is out test item here. So output of the stage is called work product, and if testing is performed on it, then it is called test item. So we can say any document or component or system which is under test is called test item. This is the first objective, to evaluate work products such as requirements, user stories, design, and code. We already know work product means output and output of the requirement stage is requirement document, where all the requirements are mentioned. Now, as per the first objective, we have to evaluate this work product. Let's see an example to understand this. Suppose this is the customer requirement. For web page, when the login details are given, the next page shall load in few milliseconds. And if login details are not correct, then show a pop-up. But if you look carefully, this requirement is not complete. There are open points. First, how much time? Second, which page will load next? Third, what is the pop-up content? These are the questions which need clarification. So this is why it is necessary to evaluate work products, such as requirements, user stories, design, and code. Second objective states, to verify whether all specified requirements have been fulfilled. Let's understand this. We already know this requirement. Now, we need to see if these requirements are fulfilled in the engineering requirement. After analyzing the customer requirement, and asking question, we finally have the engineering requirement, which includes the following points. First, login is correct, go to next page. Second, next page shall load in 500 milliseconds. Third, next page shall contain the personal information. Fourth, if the login detail is not correct, pop-up shall appear. Five, Pop-up message, password or user ID is incorrect. Like this, in each stage, we have to verify whether all specified requirements have been fulfilled. Third objective is to validate whether the test object is complete and works as the users and other stakeholders expect. Test object means object under test and it is defined as the component or system to be tested. When you are in requirement stage, requirement is your test object, and in design stage, design is your test object, and at the implementation stage, 
code is your test object. Now let's continue with our example. As per third objective, we need to provide input to the test object and check the output if it fulfills the stakeholder's requirement. That means once the software is ready, we need to execute it to see if it's fulfilling the customer's requirement. Since here we are executing the code, so this comes under validation. So third objective is to validate whether the test object is complete and works as the users and other stakeholders expect. Fourth objective is to build confidence in the level of quality of the test object. Let's understand this. Suppose we are in the requirement stage, then requirement is our test object. And if we clarify our requirement in this stage itself, instead of clarifying it during the implementation stage, then we can build confidence in our requirement and finally in our product. That is why fourth objective is to build confidence in the level of quality of the test object. Now let's discuss objectives 5 and 6 together. Objective 5 is to prevent defects and objective 6 is to find failure and defects. Let's understand these two objectives. If you find defects in the requirement stage, you prevent these defects to go to the next stage. Now the sixth objective comes into picture. We need to find the defects or failure in the same stage in which they are tested. Otherwise, defect will travel to the next stage and it will be more costly to fix. This is one of the important objectives of testing, to prevent defects, to find failure and defects. The seventh objective is to provide sufficient information to stakeholders to allow them to make informed decisions, especially regarding the level of quality of the test object. When we find defects, it's not necessary that we will fix all of it before release, but what we can do is to provide sufficient information to the stakeholders regarding defects and risks associated with it. The eighth objective is to reduce the level of risks of inadequate software quality, for example, previously undetected failures occurring in operation. This objective is related to the five and sixth objective. We need to find the defect in the same stage in which they are introduced. Otherwise, it will be found in the operation. If fault is found during operation, it can have adverse effect. That's why it is necessary to reduce the level of risks of inadequate software quality. The ninth objective is to comply with contractual, legal, or regulatory requirements or standards and to verify the test object's compliance with such requirements or standards. Sometimes you need to fulfill the legal requirements. For an example, if you are working for automotive industry, then you need to fulfill ISO 26262 standard for safety critical requirement. Till now, we discussed general testing objectives, whereas the objectives are context dependent. To understand this, let's have a look into two different testing levels, component level and acceptance level. When you perform testing at component level, your objective is to find as many defects as possible so that they are not found during operational use. Whereas if you are in acceptance level, your objective is to check if system works as expected. So in different level of testing, the objective changes. Before we end this lecture, let's have a look at the important points. One. To evaluate work products such as requirements, user stories, design, and code, to verify whether all specified requirements have been fulfilled, to validate whether the test object is complete, 
and works as the users and other stakeholders expect to build confidence in the level of quality of the test object, to prevent defects, to find failures and defects, to provide sufficient information to stakeholders to allow them to make informed decisions, especially regarding the level of quality of the test object, to reduce the level of risk of inadequate software quality, for example, previously undetected failures occurring in operation, to comply with contractual, legal, or regulatory requirements or standards, and to verify the test object's compliance with such requirements or standards. Objective of the testing is context-dependent. In this lectures, we are going to understand about testing and debugging. This is the second objective of this syllabus. You need to understand this topic since the topic is marked as K2. First, we will have a look into testing activities. Most important activity of testing is to show failure because we know by now one of the objectives of testing is to find defects. Finding defect is not only activities of testing. Other activity of testing is, once the defect is found, it is very much required to check if found defect is fixed or not. And the last point is testing is done by testers. Now, let's have a look into the debugging activities. Most important activity of debugging is to analyze failure. Once the defect is analyzed and root cause is found, next activity is to fix the defect. And the last point is debugging, is done by developers. Now here we will discuss how tester and developer work with respect to defect cycle. First tester finds the defects. Then the found defect is reported to the development team. After getting the defect report, development team starts investigating the failure. While investigating the failure, developer isolates the defect from rest of the software. Once the defect is isolated, developer fixes the defect and then checks defect is fixed or not. Once the defect is fixed, the fixed report is sent to the testing team. After getting the fixed report from developer, tester retests on found defect to confirm if they were really fixed. One more important point to remember is, in agile development and in some other life cycles, testers may be involved in debugging and component testing. Though in general debugging is developer's task, but in a agile development model, which is very iterative, Sometimes, debugging is done by testers. Before we end this topic, let's have a look into difference between testing and debugging. Very first difference is that testing is performed by tester and debugging is performed by developer. Second difference is testing finds the programming failure, whereas debugging is to demonstrate that program is working fine. Last difference is testing is done with the purpose of finding bug, whereas debugging is done to find the cause of the bug. Before we end this video, let's have a look into the important points. In a guile development and in some other life cycles, testers may be involved in debugging and component testing. Then, we learned about testing and debugging activities. Testing activities are finding defects and confirming defects are fixed, whereas developers' activity is to analyze defects and fix the defects. With this, we end this lecture here. In this lecture, we are going to address why is testing necessary. In order to understand this, we must remember that all of us are human. And being human, 
we make mistakes, and those mistakes can be very expensive. The expense can be loss of money. It can be a crucial loss of time. It can also be a loss of business reputation. And the final and gravest loss is death or injury due to our mistake. In order to avoid these losses and to minimize risk, we have to test every single aspect of our product. Let's take a look at three more points for a better understanding of why is testing necessary. First point is related to risk. We perform testing to reduce the risk associated with the product. And how do we do that? By detecting the defect, which is our next point. We have to detect defects so that they are not seen in operational use. So when the user is using our product, they should not be able to find these defects. It's our responsibility to find them first through testing. The third point is meeting the contract. We have to make sure that we are meeting all the commitments we made to our customers. So if the customer asks for something that is not included in the contract, this is where we find it. So these are the reasons testing is necessary to the process of product development. Let's say there is a developer who works on a code and creates a software. He then directly hands over that software to the customer. Now that the customer has the software, he uses it, but soon becomes very disappointed. Why? Because he has found an error in the software. So now the question arises, why did the customer find the error and not us? The answer is that once the software was developed, we handed it over directly to the customer instead of going through this rigorous process of testing. If we had put the product through this process, it is possible that we could have caught the error before it ever reached the customer. And this is where I have to mention something crucial. We have to perform appropriate testing at appropriate levels. The development of a product can be broken down into several levels of activities. At each level, we have to decide what is the appropriate testing that should be carried out. Let's take a look at these different levels of development activities. The first level is requirements. In a coming video, you will see how testing requirements contributes to success. The second level is the design stage. Here, we will see how testing design contributes to success of the project. After design comes coding. And we will also discuss how testing coding contributes to success. And finally, the software is ready and we will analyze what kind of software testing will contribute to the success of the product. If we carry out testing at each level, then we will achieve a successful product. The first topic under this section is testing's contribution to success, where we will see how testing at different levels contributes to success. The different levels of software development cycle are requirement level, where software requirements are written. Then comes the design level, where design is made. After that comes the coding level, where code is implemented. And finally, the completed software is ready for testing. Now, with example, we will understand how testing at these levels contributes to success of the overall product. Now let's discuss the first level of testing during development process, and that is the requirement level. Here, we will understand how testing during the requirement level will contribute to the success of the whole product or project. In this level, we start by reviewing the requirements. The reviewing is nothing but static testing, so we are performing static testing on the requirements. 
We are doing this to detect the defects in these work products. Here, of course, the work products are just the requirements. So why are we reviewing these requirements? It's to reduce the risk of incorrect or unstable functionality being developed. Which means, if there is something wrong or incorrect in the requirement, and we don't spot it, then that is how the entire project will be developed. This is what we have to stop by performing testing on requirement. To understand this, let's have a look into software development levels. These are the different levels in software development. First, you have the user requirement. Then, you have a system requirement. Now, if we don't correct the error at this level, it goes on and becomes part of the global design and the detailed design, both of which will be wrong. And eventually, we will have a software that doesn't work correctly. So this is why, if we correct the requirement at this stage, the rest of the process will carry out without any errors due to requirement. This is why we say that testing requirements contributes to the success of product. Now let's discuss the second level of testing during development process, and that is at the design level. At design level, there will be a system design. Our job is to do a review on it, since there is no code, so we can't run it. Therefore, we review it, which is a static testing technique. When we do this review, it will increase team members' understanding. So whether it is the tester, developer, or the process guys, everyone will have the same understanding after review. If everyone has the same knowledge, it will help reduce the risk of fundamental design defects. So a review of the system design will reduce the risk of fundamental design defects. Let's go back to our chart. Right now, we are at the global and detailed design stage. If we carry out the testing here and catch the mistake, then it will not go on to the implementation stage. We will send the correct software for the dynamic testing, and product will be a success. If we don't do the testing, then we will send a faulty software for dynamic testing, and then we will be forced to go back two steps to find the error. I hope that it's obvious now why testing at the design level is so important. It's because it contributes to the success of the whole project. Now let's discuss the third level of testing during development process, and that is the coding level. So how does testing coding contribute to success? In the coding level, you have code under development. The code is being developed and you will perform a static testing on it. The intention with this is to increase the understanding of that piece of code. What this does is reduce the risk of defects within the code. So if there are any defects, we can find them out by reviewing the code through static testing. Let's bring up our example again. Check window moves up within 10 milliseconds once the button is pressed. For this requirement, the developer has written this code. Try and see if you can tell what the mistake is in this code. The function looks right, but see here. The developer has written if button is pressed for 10 milliseconds or less, then the window will move up. The requirement was for the window to move up within 10 milliseconds, not at 10 milliseconds. The developer has included this sign, which changes the result. Now, the window might not move up unless exactly 10 milliseconds have passed. This is how performing testing at the coding level can reveal mistakes in the code and contribute to the success of the whole project. 
Now let's discuss the final level of testing during development process, and that is the software level. So let's find out how testing the software contributes to the success of the project. Once the software is ready, we verify and validate the software. Now that the software is functional and the codes are ready, we can perform dynamic testing on it. Once we perform dynamic testing, we detect failures that might otherwise have been missed. If we don't do the testing at this level, then there is a fair chance that we will miss some errors and they will finally be discovered when the software is in operational use. Next is removing the defects that cause the failures. So we will fix the problems because of which the software is failing. This is where the debugging process we discussed comes into play. The tester finds the error and tells the developer, who fixes the problem and sends it back to the tester to confirm that the error is gone. And by doing all of this, our software will meet the stakeholders' needs. It will meet the customer's or the user's requirements. And that means everyone using the software will be happy. So this is how testing at the software level helps the product succeed. Users will have an error-free software because you will have found the problems and fixed them before they used it. And that's it with this topic. In this lecture, we will focus on quality assurance and testing. Here, we will address the second topic of this session. At the end of this video, you have to understand the relationship between quality assurance and testing. The first concept is quality assurance, which is also called QA. And the second concept is testing. People often think that quality assurance and testing are the same. This is a mistake. They are not the same, but they are related. How are they related? They are related through a larger concept known as quality management. This concept ties them together. So you have to remember that while quality assurance and testing are not the same, they are related by a larger concept called quality management. Before we have a look into these terms, let's understand this concept first. First, in an organization, we establish quality management. Now the QM has QA as a subset to ensure that quality requirement will be fulfilled with the help standards and procedures. Inside QA, we have QC to check if quality is fulfilled or not. This checking is done using different testing techniques. Now, let's deal with each of these topics one by one. The first is quality management. This is a series of coordinated activities to direct and control an organization with regard to quality. So we are establishing a management system in an organization. And the objective of this management system is to achieve the quality requirement of the organization. So what is quality management? It is a larger system introduced into an organization with the single goal of achieving the best quality. The next term is quality assurance. This is a part of quality management. Quality management is a bigger system, and out of that we get quality assurance. And the purpose of QA is to focus on providing confidence that quality requirements will be fulfilled. And the final topic is quality control or testing. We already have a management and we have a standard and procedure. Now we need to implement these concepts. This implementation is done by using quality control. 
it is the operational techniques and activities, part of quality management, that are focused on fulfilling quality requirements. So, quality management is the larger system, which has two parts, quality assurance and quality control. Quality assurance contains all the documents that tell us what procedures to follow, and quality control is the activities that we have to perform in order to achieve the organization's quality requirements. So this is how you have to remember these three things. Quality control is an activity. Quality assurance is a document or a process. And quality management is the complete system under which quality assurance and quality control work. Now let's look into these two concepts a little more. Quality assurance and quality control. So, quality assurance contains proper processes, while quality control has test activities. So, this has activities and this has processes. Quality control is practical, whereas quality assurance is theoretical. The next point to look at is quality assurance is more about defect prevention. By laying our guidelines and documents, this helps prevent defects. The quality control is a defect detection mechanism. Before we end this video, let's have a look into the important points. First point is quality management ties quality assurance and testing together. Point two is quality assurance is not the same as testing. Third point is definition of quality. Quality is conformance to requirement. That means, in software testing, if we talk about quality, it means we are meeting the requirement. Fourth, an important point, testing is part of quality assurance. And last point is quality control is an end of phase activity. Let's understand this point. These are the different phases of software development. If you are in the requirement stage, once the requirement is written, the requirement undergoes testing process as a part of quality control. Similarly, for other stages, once the activity of that stage is done, quality control comes into picture. That's why we say quality control is an end of phase activity. In this lecture, we are going to understand the meaning of error, defect, and failure. This topic is marked as K2, so we need to understand this topic to answer the exam questions. Let's start with the definitions and afterwards, I will provide you the detailed explanation. What is error? A human action that produces an incorrect result is called error. Now, let's relate this definition to software testing. If the developer finds mistake in their own code, then it is referred to as an error. Second definition is defect or fault or bug. A flaw in a component or system that can cause the component or system to fail to perform its required function. Now let's relate it to the software testing. Once the software finds the bug and developer accepts it, then it is called as fault. Last definition is a failure. Deviation of the component or system from its expected delivery, service, or result. Suppose you are using the software, but it hangs. That means if the product is in use and it's not working as expected, then it's a failure. Now let's understand each of these definitions in more detail with example. What is error? A mistake in coding is called an error. If a human makes a mistake in writing a code, 
Then we call it an error. And this is the first stage. The next is defect. Error found by a tester is called defect. After that comes bug. When this defect is accepted by the development team, then it is called a bug. So far, we have three terms. If a programmer finds a mistake in their own code, then it is an error. If the mistake is found by tester, then it is a defect. If that mistake is confirmed to be a problem, then it is called a bug. And when the bug is in this stage, then it is called a fault, because it is the cause of a failure. What is a failure? Once a system is built but it is not meeting the requirements, then it is a failure. So what is causing the failure? The mistake which was not found during fault stage. Now let's use an example to understand this better. Say this is a requirement. If speed is 120 kilometers per hour or more, then overspeed warning shall come. Now say this is a code written by a developer. If speed is greater than 120 kilometers per hour, if he finds the mistake here, then it is an error. What is the mistake here? The requirement is if speed is 120 kilometers per hour or more, but here it is only greater than 120 kilometers per hour. So when speed is equal to 120 kilometers per hour, the overspeed warning will not be shown. If he notices the mistake here, then it will be called an error. If this mistake is found by a tester, then it is a defect. If the developer confirms that yes, you're right, it's a mistake, then it will be called a bug. And normally, developer finds out how many bugs are there, while tester just says that there is a defect. This is how these terminologies are used in an organization, and this stage is called a fault. Now let's say that the mistake is not found in the development stage, and the code becomes a part of the car. So now, if we find this mistake, then it is called a failure. Before we end this video, let's have a look into the important points. Now, you shall be in a position to differentiate between fault and failure. Fault is found by the tester and in the development environment, whereas failure is found by the user in the operational use. And it happens due to deviation from the requirement. And the last point is fault is the cause of the failure. In this lecture, we'll discuss different cause of defect. There are two main focuses of this discussion, normal causes of defect and environmental causes of defect. First, we will have a look into normal defect cause. The first is time pressure. If you are working in an environment where you are given very little time to complete your tasks, then it is possible that you will overlook certain things that may cause a defect. Second is human fallibility. As humans, we are all fallible, because fallible means likely to make errors or fail. Nobody's perfect after all. The second cause is inexperienced and insufficiently skilled people. If you work in an organization where there are people without sufficient knowledge of the product, then it may result in a defect. The third cause is miscommunication or misunderstanding. If your organization lacks proper channels of communication, this can also lead to defects. The fourth 
is the complexity of the code, design, and architecture. This means, even if you are an experienced, skilled person, if the code is complex, then you might end up making an error. The last cause is new, unfamiliar technologies. If you are working with a technology that you don't know well enough, then this can also result in a defect. So these were the defect causes. Now, let's move on to environmental causes. So the first cause is radiation. Proceeds of radiation can cause a defect. The next one is electromagnetic field. We all know how on flights we are asked to switch off our mobile phones. This is to avoid creating electromagnetic fields, which can cause interference. The third one is pollution. So if there are dust particles on the sensor, it could result in an error. And similarly, there could be many other environmental causes. In this lecture, we will talk about defect, root cause, and effect. This topic is marked as K2. At the end of this lecture, you shall be in a position to differentiate what is root cause and what is its effect. Let's begin by defining root cause. It is the earliest actions or conditions that contributed to creating the defects. This means that when you find a defect, you also have to find the first condition that caused the defect. Here, we have an example to help us understand this. Say, we get this requirement. Once the speed is more than 150 km per hour, red light shall glow. The speed needs to be more than 150 km per hour. After getting this feature, Customer is unhappy. Because customer checked this device and made the observation that there is a defect. Why? Because when he set the speed to 116, he expected the red light to be on, but he found that it's still off. Now to figure out why this is a defect, we have to do a root cause analysis. We are in the testing stage now. But we have to go back a step to the implementation stage or coding stage. Here, we find that there is a condition that was implemented incorrectly. If speed is equal to or greater than 150. However, our job is not yet done. Remember, we have to find the earliest condition. This means that we have to go one stage back again, which means the requirement or design stage. In this stage, we found that some of the developers have written this system requirement. Red light shall glow when speed is more than 150. So instead of 115, they wrote 150. And because of this, the implementation was done incorrectly and we found the defect in the coding. However, our job is not yet done since we have to find the earliest condition. When we investigated more, it was found that since the communication was verbal, this problem occurred. Now comes the point which you need to understand. Now, your job is to identify effect, failure, fault, or root cause. Customer is unhappy, is effect. Observation made by customer is failure. These two statements are defect. And all this problem occurs due to miscommunication, so this is the root cause. So we don't stop at this point. Now, we need to find the solution to avoid such problems. So action over here is further communication will be done via email. We will see one more example to illustrate what we learned about defect and root cause analysis. Here is the life cycle of defect root cause analysis. 
This life cycle starts with a customer complaint, which is also the effect. Why is he complaining? Because he has come across a failure. He has received incorrect interest payment calculation. So the customer is trying to calculate his interests, but received an incorrect result. This was a failure. When we analyze this failure, we find that it was caused by a single line of incorrect code. When we further investigate this defect, we find out that the wrong code was written because of the product owner's misunderstanding of how to calculate interest. This was the root cause of the defect that made the customer complain. So we have this information. The product owner didn't know how to calculate interest. But we can't stop there. We have an entire team, so how is it that the product owner could make this mistake? What we do next is called action. We figure out what to do so this never happens again. We train the product owner in interest calculation. This way, they will not repeat this mistake again. So, you see how everything is connected. This is how root cause analysis works. It starts from an effect that is the complaint and ends with an action that is our method to correct the root cause. Now, we'll look at why we need to do a root cause analysis. The first point is to prevent a significant number of future defects from being introduced. We want to make sure that new defect don't crop up in the future. The second point is to reduce the occurrence of similar defects in the future. So we don't want this interest calculation error to crop up again in our system. The third point is to improve the process. In this lecture, we will address very important point that is seven testing principles. Let's see the first principle. The first principle says that testing shows the presence of defects, not their absence. Let's break this down. The first point is testing can show that defects are present. So when we carry out testing and find a defect, then we know that there is a problem with the software. So testing can show that defects are present. The second point is that testing cannot prove that there are no defects. Just because you have not found a defect does not mean that there are no defects in the software. So testing can't prove absence of defects. The final point is that testing reduces the probability of undiscovered defects. So let's try to understand these points with an example. Suppose you have 20 defects in a software, and when you perform testing, you find 5 defects out of it. So you have 20 defects, and you found 5. So the remaining defects are 15, which could not be found. So this is why we say that testing can show that defects are present. We found five, so we know for sure that there are five defects in the software. But we cannot prove that there are no defects in the software. We found five of 20 defects, but there are 15 left that we don't know about. So we cannot prove that there are no defects left in the software. And finally, testing reduces the probability of undiscovered defects. How does that happen? Initially, we had 20 defects, but we found 5, so only 15 are left. We have reduced the number of defects that the customer can find, so that was the first principle of testing. Let's move to the second principle. Principle 2 says that exhaustive testing is impossible. Please remember this, that exhaustive testing is impossible. The first point to understand about this 
is testing everything is not feasible. Just because we have a software doesn't mean we can test every single bit of it. The second point is, whenever we do testing, it has to depend on risk analysis. What is the risk of that particular system? Depending upon that we have to see what kind of testing is required. Then, we focus on what type of test techniques are needed and what are the priorities of different features. We can't just test everything. We need to prioritize certain parts based on how important they are. The final point is to focus test effort. When we're testing a feature, we need to know how much effort it requires. This is why exhaustive testing is impossible. Testing requires a certain amount of effort, and that is why testing everything is not feasible. Let's use an example here. Say a customer's requirement is the following. LED shall glow when speed is between 15 and 90 kilometers per hour. So there is a LED that will only glow when the speed is between 15 and 90. One way of testing this requirement is to do a boundary value analysis. For this test, we have taken six values. On one end, we have 14, 15, and 16. And on the other end, we have 89, 90, and 91. So when we do the testing, the LED should not glow at 14 or 15, and on the other, it should not glow for 90 or 91. It should only work for 16 and 89. So only by using six values, we can test if the software meets the customer's requirement. But it is also possible to test with all the values between 15 to 90. But that will consume a lot of time and effort. Also, the boundary values serve our purpose. So this is the reason that we say that testing each and every part of the feature is not feasible. It is possible, but not practical. Of course, if the customer asks us, then we can perform testing on all the values in between. Let's look at the third principle of testing now. Principle 3 states that every testing saves time and money. Let's break that down. The first point is that static and dynamic test activities should be started as early as possible. What does that mean? It means that we should start testing as early as possible, whether it is a static test or a dynamic test. Now, let's look at the second point. Early testing is sometimes referred to as shift left. Why is that? Look here. As I'm talking about early testing, I'm shifting to the left of the diagram. The very first stage of testing is at the leftmost corner of the software development life cycle. So early testing is sometimes called shift left. And finally, we come to the last point. It helps to reduce or eliminate costly changes. We can see it in the example to understand that. So here is a very popular graph about the cost and time of finding defects. As you can see, in the requirement stage, the cost of locating a defect is the lowest. When you move to the design stage, it becomes a little costlier. Then, as you move to the build stage and then to the test stage, it gets more and more expensive. Finally, at live use, it is the costliest to discover a defect in the product. So why does this happen? To understand this, we need our life cycle diagram. Suppose we find a defect in the implementation stage, which is the build stage. Just because it was found at this stage does not mean that the error happened here. It might be in the design or the system requirement. It can also be that someone misunderstood the user's requirements 
because of which every subsequent stage was wrong and we implemented it incorrectly. So now, to correct this one defect, we have to go back and correct this document, this document, this document, and this one too. All of this will take a lot of time, labor, and resources, which means that it will cost a lot of money. This is why Principle 3 says perform testing as early as possible. If we find an error here, then we can correct it here, and every other stage will be fine. Now, we are on the fourth principle of testing. Principle 4 states that defects cluster together. To understand this, let's start with the first point. Sometimes, a small number of modules can contain most of the defects. And point number 2 is, those defects can be responsible for most of the operational failures. Though these are only a few modules, the defects present in them can cause operational failure. What is operational failure? It is when the product is in use and fails to perform according to expectations. So if we can identify the module or the part of the software that contains these defects, then it will help us reduce or eliminate costly changes. If we find them during our testings, then they won't crop up during live use and we can save the expenses on correcting them. So that's the fourth principle, to identify the module where most of the defects are clustered together. Now we're on to the fifth principle of testing. Principle 5 states, beware of the pesticide paradox. What does this mean? Let's find out. Point 1. The same test no longer finds defects. During testing, if you've already found a defect in a code, then it is unlikely that you will find a defect again. Unless there is a big change in the code, you will find no more errors since you already found one and corrected it. So then what do we do? Point 2. To detect new defects, existing tests and test data may need to change. So you either have to update the test case or the data in it to be able to find new defects in it. And the third point is, when you're performing automated regression testing, the pesticide paradox has a beneficial outcome. When you run automated testings, you are actually running scripts. So if you run the same script, it is highly unlikely that you will find new defects. But if you update your script, add new values to it, or new test cases to it, then there is a possibility of discovering new defects. So this paradox is very beneficial when you're performing an automated testing. Suppose there is a software with 20 defects in it. When you run your script the first time, you find 5 defects. Then, the software is left with 15 defects. Now, if you don't change the test script and you run it for the second and third time, you will find no more defects in the software. No matter how many times you run it, you cannot find the 15 remaining defects. This is because you're running the same script. In order to find new defects, you have to update your script. So this is why our first point said that the same test will no longer find defects. And the second one said, to detect new one, existing tests may need to change. So now, you understand the fifth principle. We will cover the sixth principle. It states that testing is context-dependent. This means that the type of testing will depend upon the kind of product being tested. This is why testing is context-dependent. So let's start breaking this down. Point 1. Safety-critical industry control software is tested differently from an e-commerce mobile app. So a mobile application and a safety-critical software will be tested differently. 
We can't use the same process for both applications. Now, point two. Testing in an Agile project is done differently than testing in a sequential life cycle project. Our methods of testing in an Agile project is completely different from how we test in a sequential life cycle project. The final point is all about e-commerce. This is connected to the first point. How we test e-commerce is completely different. This is why principle 6 emphasizes that testing is context dependent. This principle states that absence of error is a fallacy. If you remember, we have already covered the essence of this in principle 1 and 2. Let's deconstruct that. Point 1. In an organization, it is expected that testers can run all possible tests and find all possible defects. This expectation is completely wrong. We can't run all possible tests and we cannot find all possible defects. Point two, says principle two and one respectively, tell us that this is impossible. If you recall, principle two says that exhaustive testing is impossible and one says that we can never find all the bugs. We can claim to have found a bug, but we cannot claim that there are no defects left in the software. Further, it is a fallacy that is a mistaken belief. So this is an incorrect belief that a tester can find all the mistakes that exist in a software. Our final point here is thoroughly testing all specify requirements and fixing all defects found could still produce a system that is difficult to use. Even if we do everything, there can still be environmental conditions, unfound defects, or other factors that can cause the product to fail. It's not in your hands. This is why we cannot say that there are no errors left in a software. If someone claims that, then it is a mistaken belief. Before we end this video, Let's have a look into the important points. In this lecture, we will address test process. Let's first see what is test process and why it's needed. As of now, we know there are seven test objectives, and to fulfill these test objectives, each one of us will have different ways. If we all apply our own ways in an organization, then it is difficult to control and it is less likely to achieve test objectives. That is a reason we need common process, which everyone shall follow as a guideline to achieve the different test objectives. In this syllabus, seven common test activities are mentioned, which can be applied for any product. These seven activities are test planning, test monitoring and control, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test completion. Altogether, these activities are referred to as test process. Under test process, we will have a look into these topics. All these topics are marked as K2, so you need to understand these topics. First topic is, explain the impact of context on the test process. 
Here, we'll come to know what are the different factors that influence test process. Second topic is, describe the test activities and respective tasks within the test process. Here, I will explain each of the test activities in detail. Third topic is, differentiate the work products that support the test process. We have seven common test activities. After each test activity, we will get the output, which is referred as work product. In this topic, we need to remember which work product belongs to with activities. Last topic is, explain the value of maintaining traceability between the test bases and test work products. Here, we will learn about traceability. In this lecture, we will address keywords related to test process topic. And these are the keywords which we are going to cover in this lecture because they are related to the upcoming topics. Few I will cover now, and remaining will cover while addressing the topic. These are the eight keywords you must know before we go to the test process topic. All the definitions provided here are given by ISTQB itself. Along with the definition, I will provide some real examples for easy understanding of these terms. So let's start with the keywords. First keyword is test basics, and it is defined as the body of knowledge used as the basis for test analysis and design. In simple terms, test basis is nothing but the requirement. Let's see an example to understand this. Suppose this is the requirement. We need a light system which will glow when door is open and close when door is closed. The system shall work like mentioned. This is a requirement which we need to test and it is refined as test basics. Now let's see the second keyword. Test condition and it is defined as a testable aspect of a component or system identified as a basis for testing. Let's refer to the same example to find out testable aspect of the requirement. The testable aspects are, first, light shall glow when door is open. Second, light shall not glow when door is closed. After reading the test basics, we got this as a testable condition. Next keyword is test case, and it is defined as a set of preconditions, inputs, actions where applicable, expected results and post conditions developed based on test conditions. In simple words, test cases are set of actions to test the test condition. Let's continue with our example to understand this point. Now, to check these test conditions, we can write two test cases as shown here. Test case one is, first, switch on power, second, open door, three, check light on, four, switch off power. And test case two is, first, switch on power, second, close door, third, check light off, fourth, switch off power. Action to test, test condition, is called test cases. The next keyword is test procedure, and it is defined as a sequence of test cases in execution order and any associated actions that may be required to set up the initial preconditions and any wrap-up activities post-execution. This term is used mostly when you go for manual testing, where you decide in which order test cases to be executed, or if any precondition or post-conditions are required. Now, let's have a look into test case 1. After the test case is executed, the door shall be closed and light to be switched off. Similarly, for test case 2, during initial condition, the door shall be open and light must be on so that we can see the change. Next keyword is test data, and it is defined as data needed for test execution. This term is used during the automation testing. While executing the test case, we need test data. Let's see the sample data to understand this point. 
In the test case, we are saying switch on power supply, but we didn't mention how much voltage shall be provided. This data we will get from test data. Similarly, all other values with respect to test cases are stored. These data can be stored in Excel form or any testing specific tools. Let's move to the next keyword, that is test suit, and it is defined as a set of test scripts or test procedures to be executed in a specific test run. Test scripts mean a set of instructions for the execution of a test. By using test case as a reference, test scripts are developed. These test scripts are then arranged in the execution order as shown here. That's why we can say a group of test scripts with a sequence of instructions is called suit. Next keyword is testware. It is defined as work products produced during the test process for use in planning, designing, executing, evaluating, and report on testing. As we know, we have different activities in test process like test planning, test monitoring, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test closure. Each of these activities provide output and these outputs are called testware. Testware are stored for each testing phase for future reference. Last key point is test oracle, and it is defined as a source to determine an expected result to compare with the actual result of the system under test. As the definition says, test oracle stores expected result, which is compared against the measured result during test execution. These were the eight keywords which we covered here, and it will be very helpful for you as we cover the following topics. Thank you. In this lecture, we are going to see how test process varies with respect to its context. First topic of test process is explain the impact of context on the test process. It is marked as K2, which means you need to understand this topic. Before we start the topic, just remember ISO standard for test process is ISO IEC IEEE 29119-2. First context is based on software development lifecycle model and project methodologies being used. To understand this point, let's have a look into these two software development lifecycle models, V model and Agile model. V model is an incremental process where all the phases are done sequentially in an incremental way. But in a Guile model, each phases are repeated throughout the development phase. We can see in picture to understand these two processes. In the V model, the complete project is implemented incrementally, and once the development phase is done, corresponding testing activity is started. Whereas in a Guile method, Few features are implemented in a week, and testing is done for that feature. And this repeats throughout the project development. Therefore, same test process is implemented in a different way based on the model used. Just remember, first context is software development lifecycle model and project methodologies being used. The second context is test level and test type being considered. Based on test level and test type, test process is selected. When we say test level, these are the four different levels mentioned in this course. Component testing, integration testing, system testing, and acceptance testing. And different test types are functional test types, non-functional test types, white box testing, and change-related testing. Each of this will be covered in upcoming lectures. For the time being, just remember, second context is test level and test type. The third context is product and project risk. Let's take an example of two different products, automotive and avionic. By seeing the project, you will come to know which has more risk. Avionics product contain more risk than automotive. 
Therefore, the test process will be more regress for product with more risk. For the time being, just remember, third context is product and project risk. The fourth context is business domain, which is similar to last context, product and project risk. To understand this, let's see two different domain, software for supermarket billing and software for banking domain. Clearly, supermarket software will be more focused on load testing, whereas banking software will be tested more with respect to safety aspects. Fourth context is business domain. The fifth context is based on operational constraints. For an example, budget and resource means if assigned budget is less or sufficient to complete the project, time scale means whether you need to complete project in less time or you have sufficient time. Complexity means if the product selected is complex to implement. And last one is contractual and regulatory requirements. Sometime along with the customer requirement, we also need to fulfill industry-related requirement. Like for automotive safety, we need to fulfill ISO 26262 standards. Sixth context is organizational policies and practices. The type of development model used has impact on the test planning and test process. Similarly, the type of test strategy, test techniques, and tools used in an organization influence test process. Last context is required internal and external standards. As mentioned before, ISO 26262 is a safety standard for automotive industry. It's an external standard which organization has to follow if they are working on automotive industry and need to be included in the test process. ASPICE is another standard which is related to process. If some organization needs to compliance to ASPICE standard, they have to adopt their process in accordance with ASPICE. Now, let's quickly revise all the points we mentioned with respect to context. Software development lifecycle model and project methodologies being used. Test levels and test types being considered. Product and project risks. Business domain. Operational constraints including but not limited to budgets and resources, time scales, complexity, contractual and regulatory requirements, organizational policies and practices, required internal and external standards. Before we start with test process, let's have an overview of what we will be seeing in upcoming videos. There are three general aspects of organizational test processes. First aspect is test activity and task. Second aspect is test work product. Third aspect is traceability. Let's understand what they mean. By now, we know test process is divided into seven different test activities, and they are test planning, test monitoring and control, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test completion. Each of these activities has tasks within them, which we will study in detail in future classes. So when we perform these activities, we get certain outputs, and those outputs are referred as test work product. So remember this point. Output of test activity is test work product. Let's see some of the work products which we get out of these test activities. In the test planning stage, we get test plans as output. From test monitoring and control stage, we get test progress report as an output. From test analysis stage, we get list of prioritized test conditions. From test design stage, we get test cases as an output. And output of test implementation is test suits. Output of test execution is defect report. And finally, output of test completion is finalized test wares. These are important points from exam point of view. I request you to memorize them at this point of time. 
Last point is related to traceability. Let's first understand traceability concept, and then we will go through the definition. Suppose customer gave you some requirement to test, and the requirement looks like this. Customer requirement 1. Customer requirement 2. Customer requirement 3. Customer requirement 4. It can go up to 1,000 requirements, which we are representing by the letter N here. Once you get these requirements, you will develop test cases for the requirement. And suppose it looks like this. Test case 1. Test case 2. Test case 3. Test case 4. And it is up to you how many test cases you want to write to cover all the requirements. But now comes the important question. How will you provide the test case for customer requirement 4? It is humanly not possible to provide test case for the requested customer requirement if you have thousands of requirements. To solve this problem, we have traceability. During traceability, we develop a virtual bi-directional link between requirement and test cases by using some tools. Let's see how we do that. As soon as we write the test case for requirement, we link them using a tool. For example, requirement 1 is linked to test case 1. Since we have a bi-directional traceability, anytime we can see which test case is connected to requirement 1 or which requirement is connected to test case 1. Similar way, we can provide traceability for other test cases. Now you can see each requirement has test cases. This is all about the traceability concept. Now let's see the definition. To maintain traceability throughout the test process between each element of the test basis and the various test work products associated with that element. Traceability is nothing but linking between requirement, test condition, test case, and report. So just remember three aspects of organizational test process are test activity and task, test work product, and traceability. Last point is ISO IEC IEEE 29119-2 has information about test process and ISO IEC IEEE 29119-3 has information about test work products. With this, we end this lecture here. Let's start with the first activity of test process, that is, test planning. We know by now these are the seven test processes. It starts from test planning, then comes test monitoring and control, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and ends with test completion. So let's understand what is test planning and what are the different tasks done under it. Test planning involves activities that define the objectives of testing. So test planning is the stage where we decide what we need to test and what we want to achieve from it. It also includes approach for meeting test objectives within constraints imposed by the context. We know that testing is context-dependent. Based on what we test, we decide in test planning stage which approach we will use. And last point is test plans may be revisited based on feedback from monitoring and control activities. The question is why we need to revisit test plan. Suppose while testing you find that you cannot achieve the defined objective. It could be due to time constraints in that case, we need to revisit test plan to see if we can increase the testing time or we increase resource to complete testing in same time, or we go for risk-based testing by keeping time and resource constant. So any time during testing, we will the defined objective or approach is not feasible that we will need to revisit test plan and update it. So these are the three main points of test planning. Defining test objective, defining test approach, updating plan base on feedback. Now below are the points which are mentioned in fifth chapter, but we are including them here for the better understanding of the topic. In test planning stage, we determine the scope objectives and risks of testing. Since test planning is the first activity of test process, we define the roadmap of testing here. We decide what will be the scope of our testing, whether we want to perform integration testing or software testing 
or system testing, or all of this. Next is objective. We can determine that we want to do 50% of the testing, or we only need to perform testing on priority one features. Like this, there can be another objective, which we would like to achieve. Next is risk. Once we get the project, we analyze the risk associated with the feature, and based on that, we decide whether to go for testing based on the features implemented or based on analyzed risk. First point is determining the scope, objectives, and risks of testing. Second task in test planning is defining the overall approach of testing. We know that testing is context dependent. Based on what we test, we decide which approach we will use. For an example, we can go for risk-based testing if this release is critical to the customer. We can go for priority-based testing to make sure that we perform the testing on critical features as early as possible so that if any bug is found, it can be fixed and released. Or go for requirement-based testing to make sure if all the requirements are tested before release. Or choose related testing to make sure all the changed features are testing before release. Third point is integrating and coordinating the test activities into the software lifecycle activities. Let's see this example. Here, we saw how traceability depends on the tool. And to provide the traceability between all the work products, we need to integrate test activities into software lifecycle activities. Let's move to fourth point. In test planning, we answer what to test and how to test. Let's see how. In test planning state, we make decision about what to test, the people and other resources required to perform the various test activities, and how test activities will be carried out. Fifth point is related to task scheduling. Let's see an example of scheduling. This is the roadmap prepared during test planning. Here, we define when testing will start, when test analysis and design shall be completed. Similarly, other test activities are planned. Sixth point is related to metrics. In test planning stage, we select metrics for test monitoring and control. For an example, let's have a look into traceability. Suppose, in planning, we decide a matrix to activate 100% traceability. But if the testing team do not write test case for one of the customer requirements, then we will not get the link. Since all the data is in tool, by putting some filters, we can easily find out how many requirements are linked and how many are not. This way, we get different data through matrix. Seventh point is related to budget. In the planning stage, we finalize budgeting for the test activities. Eighth point is about documentation. In planning stage, we determine the level of detail and structure for test documentation. Here, we decide which document we need at the end of the testing activating, and during testing, we collect data for the documents. Last point is a very important point. Test planning is a continuous activity and is performed throughout the product's life cycle, which means test planning is not a one-time activity. It is done throughout the development cycle. Please go through all the points once again to remember each point. See you in next lecture. In this lecture, we will discuss test monitoring and control. Test monitoring and control is the second test activity of test planning. As we know, test planning draws the roadmap for the test activity, which includes scheduling, like when testing will start, when it will end, similarly for all other test activities. But in reality, it is not possible to provide the fixed timing and follow it due to many operational issues. That is the reason it is advised to monitor current status of each test activity against the planned one so that if there is any lag, we can take necessary action to meet the planned schedule. Now let's see the definition of test monitoring, test control, and then we see an important point on test monitoring and test planning. Test monitoring involves the ongoing comparison of actual progress against planned progress 
using any test monitoring metrics defined in the test plan. Let's have a look into this. In test planning stage, we decide when the analysis will start and when it will end. While monitoring, we compare the current status of test analysis with the planned schedule. Next term is test control. It involves taking actions necessary to meet the objectives of the test plan. And the last point is test monitoring and control. They're supported by the evaluation of exit criteria which are referred to as the definition of done in some software development lifecycle models. We will understand what is evaluation of exit criteria in next slide. Evaluation of exit criteria include checking, assessing, and determining. We have to check test results and logs against specified coverage criteria. We have to assess the level of component or system quality based on test results and logs. And we need to determine if more tests are needed. These are the points based on which we need to evaluate the exit criteria. One of the important points why we do test monitoring and control is to communicate information to the stakeholder. Let's see what type of information we share. First point is test progress against the plan. Second point is if there is any deviations from the plan. And the last point is information to support any decision to stop testing. So these are the different information we communicate to stakeholder and these information is gathered during test monitoring phases. In this lecture, we will address remaining test activities. As of now, test planning, test monitoring and control is covered. Now, we will focus on test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution and test completion. First start with test analysis. During test analysis, the test basis is analyzed to identify testable features and define associated test conditions. Now, I will break down this definition and explain to you with the help of an example. First point which you need to remember is during test analysis, we look for what to test. During test analysis, test basis is analyzed. As we know, test basis is nothing but the requirement. Suppose this is the requirement. We need a light system which will glow when door is open and close when door is closed. The system shall work like mentioned. This is only a requirement. Now from the requirement, we need to find testable feature. From this requirement, we get this as a testable feature. Light shall glow when door is open and close when door is closed. We will not stop here. We have to find the test condition. From test feature, we finally derive these test conditions. First, light shall glow when door is open. Second, light shall not glow when door is closed. So that's why we say, during test analysis, the test basis is analyzed to identify testable features and define associated test conditions. Next test activity is test design. And during test design, the test conditions are elaborated into high-level test cases, sets of high-level test cases, and other testware. Now let's see an example to understand this definition. During test analysis, we used to ask what to test, whereas during test design, we ask how to test. Here, we elaborate the test condition to high-level test cases. Let's understand this. We already saw how we get test condition from test basis. Now, during test design, we write test cases based on test condition. This is the example how we write test case. Test case 1. Switch on power. 
Open door. Check light on. Switch off power. Test case 2. Switch on power. Close door. Check light off. Switch off power. This two test case will cover two test condition. Now along with writing test case, we also identify the defect in the test basis. Because while writing test case, we refer test condition and test basis. And during this, if we find any mistake, we shall report it. That is why we say, during test design, the test conditions are elaborated into high-level test cases, sets of high-level test cases, and other testware. After test design comes test implementation, and during test implementation, the testware necessary for test execution is created and completed, including sequencing the test cases into test procedures. Now let's understand this with the help of an example. As of now, we know during test analysis we ask what to test. During test design, we ask how to test. And now, during test implementation, we ask, do we now have everything in place to run the tests? First point is, testware necessary for test execution is created and completed. To test our requirement, we need computer, switch, battery, door, and light. So during test implementation, we need to arrange them and check if they are in ready state. Second point is sequencing the test cases into test procedures. During test implementation, we sequence the test cases based on priority or risk. As you can see here how test cases are sequenced, and this is the order we will execute them. And last point is related to test script. This point is applicable only if you are doing automation testing. Here, test cases are converted into test scripts so that they can be automatically executed. That's why we say, during test implementation, the test where necessary for test execution is created and completed, including sequencing the test cases into test procedures. After test implementation comes test execution. And during test execution, test suits are run in accordance with the test execution schedule. Here, we ask a question, are all tests run? Here, we run all the test suits. Test suits consist of set of test cases. We already saw this test suit, and during test execution, we run them at this order. Second point is after running the test cases, we complete and evaluate the result. Here, the expected result is compared with the measured result. That's why we say, during test execution, test suits are run in accordance with the test execution schedule. Last activity of test process is test completion. Test completion activities collect data from completed test activities to consolidate experience, testware, and any other relevant information. So this is the activity where we collect all the output from the previous activity. Now let's understand this. Till now, we saw. In test planning, output is test plan. In test monitoring, output is feedbacks. In test analysis, output is test conditions. Output of test design is test case. Output of test implementation is test script and the output of test execution is test result. Now, let's revise all the definition again before we end this lecture. First point is test analysis. During test analysis, the test basis is analyzed to identify testable features and define associated test conditions. And we ask what to test. Second activity is test design. During test design, the test conditions are elaborated into high-level test cases, sets of high-level test cases, and other testware. And we ask the question, how to test? 
Third activity is test implementation. During test implementation, the testware necessary for test execution is created and completed, including sequencing the test cases into test procedures. And here we ask, is everything ready for test? Fourth activity is test execution. During test execution, test suits are run in accordance with the test execution schedule. Here, we can ask, are all the results compared? Fifth activity is test completion. Test completion activities collect data from completed test activities to consolidate experience, testware, and any other relevant information. Here, we can ask, have we collected all the data? In the previous lecture, we saw different activities of test process, and in this lecture, we will see what is the output of those activities. The output of the test activity is called test work product. So this is going to be our third topic of this session, where we have to differentiate the work products that support the test process, and it is marked as K2, so we have to understand this topic. Similar to test process, we have ISO standard for test work product, and it is ISO IEC IEEE 29119-3. This standard only provides the template, but actual implementation depends on the context, as we saw in the test process. It varies from organization to organization and product to product. Now let's see what is the output of test planning and test monitoring phase. The output of test planning is test plans, which contains all the scheduling related details, exit criteria, it tells when to say test activity is completed, traceability information, here we decide link between test basis and output of test activity. Now let's see the output of test monitoring stage. As we know, test monitoring is done at each test activity, and at the end of that test activity, we collect the test report of that stage like test progress report, test summary report. And during test monitoring, we decide if task is completed, resources allocated properly, and they are used efficiently, or if additional effort is required. These were the test work products of test planning and test monitoring. Now let's see the output of test analysis, design, implementation, execution, and completion. We will start with test analysis. First output, which we get, is defined and prioritized test conditions. So along with finding the test condition, we also prioritize them. Second output is creation of test charter. Test charter means documentation of the goal or objective for a test session. Third output is discovery and reporting of defects in the test basis. Now let's see the output of test design activity. First output is test case and set of test case. As we know, during test design, we write test cases and therefore test case is the output. Second point is identification of the test data. Here, be careful. In the test design stage, we only identify the test data. We don't prepare them. Preparation of the test data is done in test implementation stage, so be careful with this point. Similar to this is the third point. Test environment is designed in the test design stage, whereas it is implemented in the test implementation stage. Along with test data and test environment, test infrastructure and tools are identified in this stage. So be careful with these points. Test data, test environment, infrastructure, and tool are only identified in test design stage. Now let's see the work product of test implementation. First output is test procedures and the sequencing of those test procedures. Second output is 
test suits. Test suit is collection of test scripts in execution order. Third point is test execution schedule. Fourth output is service virtualization and automated test scripts. In some cases, test implementation involves creating work products using or used by tools, such as service virtualization and automated test scripts. Fifth output is creation of test data and test environment. During test design, we only identify test data and test environment, but in test implementation, they are created. Last point is, test conditions defined in test analysis may be further refined in test implementation. Now let's see the work product of test execution. First output is, documentation of the status of individual test cases or test procedures. Since the test case is run here, we need to document how many test cases are ready to run, how many test cases are passed and failed, how many test cases didn't execute, and how many test cases we didn't execute deliberately. Second output is defect report. During test execution, Test cases are executed and expected result is compared with measured result, and if they are not same, then defect is reported. Third output is documentation about which test item, test object, test tools, and testware were involved in the testing. So all the things used during test execution are documented and stored so that they can be used again if asked Finally, test completion. This is the test activity, which comes once all other test activities are completed. So here, our task is to collect all the reports, like test summary report. Along with report, we need to document any improvement points which we can use for next release. Next point is related to change request or backlog. During test activity, if we didn't test any test case, or if we didn't execute some test scripts, then we need to document them so that we can address them in next release. Last point is finalized testware. Everything which was used during testing and all the output are stored. Many of the test work products described in this section can be captured and managed using test management tools and defect management tools. This was the complete explanation of test work product topic. This topic is very important, so please read it once again, and if necessary, watch the video again to remember all the points mentioned. Thank you. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about traceability. This is going to be the last topic of this session. Here, we will explain the value of maintaining traceability between the test basis and test work product, and it is marked as K2. Let's first understand the concept of traceability. It starts with test basis. From test basis, we derive test condition. Then, we develop test cases for each test condition. After that, we develop test script based on test cases. And finally, we get result. Now let's see how traceability is established between test basis and test work product. First, the traceability is maintained between test basis and test condition. Now, we have two test cases for these test conditions, so each of these test conditions need to be traced to test cases. Test condition 1 is traced with test case 1. Now test case 1 shall be traced with test script 1. And finally, test script is traced with result. Now, if customer wants to know how we tested test condition 1, we can show them using this traceability. Similarly, for test condition 2, we have to establish traceability. By now, we know what is traceability. Now, 
let's understand why traceability is required. First point is to implement effective test monitoring and control process. Second point is to revent to test planning based on the feedback. Third point is to communicate to stakeholder. Now let's see the importance of traceability. First point is analyzing the impact of change. To understand this, suppose there is a change in the requirement. Then due to traceability, we will come to know which all work products are affected and for the base, we will update them. Second point is making testing auditable. Now, since every item is linked, it is easy while auditing the project. Point number three is meeting IT governance criteria. Fourth point is improving the understandability of test progress reports and test summary reports to include the status of elements of the test basis. For example, requirements that pass their tests, requirements that failed their tests, and requirements that have pending tests. This point is self-explanatory. Fifth point is relating the technical aspects of testing to stakeholders in terms that they can understand. Since we provide the traceability, now we can generate different types of matrix and provide it to stakeholders. Last point is providing information to assess product quality, process capability, and project progress against business goals. Since we have different matrices, we can assess product quality and its process. Today, we're covering psychology of testing. The first thing we need to learn is the concept of confirmation bias. Here's the definition. It is difficult to accept information that disagrees with currently held beliefs. So when a human is faced with an idea that goes against what he believes, he will refuse to accept it. Our human here is a software developer. And when someone comes and tells him that his software is not functioning properly, it's difficult for him to believe that. This is nothing new. It is a common human trait to blame the bearer of bad news. In our example, the bearer of bad news is the tester because he is going to the developer to tell him that his software is not working correctly. So how do you handle this kind of situation between the tester and the developer? The action point is, information about defects and failures should be communicated in a constructive way. So, whenever the tester finds a defect and has to tell the developer, he has to find a constructive way to communicate. He shouldn't criticize the developer, but stick to explaining what the real problem is. So now we move on to human psychology and testing. It is the tester's job to understand how the other person feels when he tells them that their software isn't working well. In order to do that, he needs to communicate well. He should develop his communication skills so that he isn't criticizing the developer but giving constructive feedback. To further help with this aspect, the tester should keep the following points in mind. Start with collaboration rather than battle. You do this by emphasizing the benefits of testing. You make the developer understand how testing is helping his software. Confirm that the other person has understood what has been said and vice versa. You have to be sure that the developer understood everything you said and that you understood everything that the developer has said. And finally, communicate test results and other findings in a neutral, fact-focused way. So you should have all the documents, all the test scripts, and results with you that would support your point. This will show the developer why his product isn't working and you will have avoided any conflict resulting from hurt feelings. That's all from this video. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, happy testing! Hello! 
Now we're going to discuss the mindset of testers and developers. First, we'll talk about the developer's mindset. The developer has to design and build a product. Next is, they have to design and build solutions. If there is a defect or a new feature needs to be added, they have to come up with the solution for them. And finally, the most important point. Confirmation bias makes it difficult to find mistakes in their own work. Since developers are creating their own codes, it's hard for them to spot their own mistakes. So now, let's take a look at tester's mindset. The first point is that tester will verify and validate the product. Developer designs the products, and the tester verifies and validates it. The second is that the tester needs to have curiosity, a critical eye, and attention to detail. So whenever they are reading the requirement, they should pay close attention and try to understand the requirement from different perspectives. Finally, the tester needs to have the motivation to establish good and positive communications and relationships with other team members. Having said all that, we now come to a very important point. Independent testers increase defect detection effectiveness. A tester is most effective when they think independent and are not biased against the developer. They will find the defects because they have a fresh perspective on the product, and this will lead to productive discussions between the tester and the developer. So once again, independent testers increase defect detection effectiveness. That's all from this video. I'll see you next time.